Yep. All right, Corey, we'll go ahead and get started if everyone's ready. I call this meeting of the Lakota Board of Education on Thursday, July 7th, 2022 to order. Mrs. Logan, would you call the roll? Mr. Adi? Yes. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. Bodie? Here. And I'm not sure if Julie is. She's Mrs. Schaefer? Here. And Mrs. O'Connor? Here. Board, I'll take a motion to consider to move into executive session to consider the appointment, employment, and compensation of a public employee. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Adi. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Casper. Any discussion? Mrs. Logan. Mr. Adi. Here. Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Casper. Yes. Mrs. Bodie. Yes. And Mrs. O'Connor. Yes. And I want to explain the reason why I did not call for Mrs. Schaefer's vote is because legally she can be part of the meeting, but she cannot vote. So I'm not ignoring you, Julie. <laughs> and Julie, thank you for taking the time to be with us. We will call you downstairs. All right. Audience will be back with you once we finished executive session and there'll be no action taken in executive session. Thank you.
right afterwards. Or microphones back on. Mine's on. Reconvening from executive session that we held for the purpose of considering the appointment employment compensation of a public employee. We've already called the roll. Mrs. Bodie, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Board, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Mrs. Bodie, Mr. Adi, any discussion? Would you call the roll, Mrs. Logan? <clears throat> Mrs. Bodie? Yes. Mr. Adi? Yes. Mrs. Casper? Yes. And Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. I have uh, several items under board president's comment. The first is representative Thomas Hall is with us today. And we've received a lot of questions about a house bill recently that he sponsored. So we've given him an opportunity to come and speak on that for just a moment. And board, he will take questions from the board afterwards. And we're going to limit this to about five minutes. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, School Board of <laughs> Education. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to come before you to speak about House Bill 99 and to talk uh, about what the bill really is and what it accomplishes and, have, and answer any questions that you guys feel uh, that you guys have. Uh, as Mrs. O'Connor talked about, my name is State Representative Thomas Hall. I'm serving in my first term in the 53rd House District. That's the northern and western parts of Butler County. As a former uh, two-term Mass Township trustee, thank you for your service uh, to the Lakota School District. Uh, congratulations uh, to Mrs. Logan on a great career. Uh, we will miss you uh, here in, in Butler County. Thank you. Uh, I'm here today to not discuss anything about a campaign, but to discuss the official capacity with House Bill uh, 99. Uh, House Bill 99 was a bill uh, that was introduced in February of 2021. House Bill 99 went through 18 different versions. I have the a copy of the 18th version. Uh, with me today that I keep. Uh, House Bill 99 is very, very clear on what it sets forth to accomplish. Uh, it is not what uh, we have seen in the media or from other perspectives. House Bill 99 is a permissive piece of legislation, not a mandate from the state, that allows school boards the option to arm staff members here in the state of Ohio. When we started this journey in February of 2021, we were never arguing whether guns should be in school or not, that is actually already state law. What we were trying to clarify was the gray area of law that dealt with the amount of training required for this practice. House Bill 99, again, still permissive, sets a minimum, but not a maximum amount of training required to have this practice in school districts all across Ohio. That minimum being uh, 24 hours uh, and then eight hours annually. Uh, House Bill 99 is a bill uh, that we have uh, taken a lot of IP meetings, a lot of meetings with opponents to the bill, proponents to the bill. Uh, and doing that, we set forth a uh, transparency piece. Uh, if the school board decides to enact this policy, uh, the school board has to notify the public by whatever means they regularly uh, communicate with the public that they have enacted this policy. Let's be very clear about that. In that, that is public record. Uh, nothing else is public record. Uh, the teachers carrying, um, where they are carrying, what they are carrying, that none of that is public record. That's still a part of the school uh, and their safety plan. Uh, we wrote the bill um, in a way uh, to accommodate all schools in the state of Ohio. Uh, here in Butler County, we are very, very fortunate uh, to have a law enforcement presence that can be close uh, to all the schools uh, here in our county. 
Uh, some schools in the state of Ohio are not as fortunate. Uh, there are some schools in Southeast Ohio, Northeast Ohio uh, that we've talked to, or we've worked with. Uh, they actually arm their staffs a lot more than other schools in our, in our great state. Uh, why do they do that response time? Some schools, believe it or not, in the state of Ohio are not fortunate enough to have, number one, a school resource officer, or number two, to have a school uh, to have a, a safety force uh, be there and respond within minutes uh, of an incident occurring. Uh, where does this come from? Why did I introduce this bill? Uh, in 2016, uh, as you guys are, many of you are aware, Madison Oak Schools had a school shooting. Uh, my father was a school resource officer in that building at that time. Uh, he responded to the lunchroom in seven seconds, uh, chasing the shooter out the front, front of the building. Uh, after that uh, shooting occurred, the Madison School Board took a step to arm their staffs. Uh, that resolution was met by a challenge by families uh, in the district, uh, which uh, brought the case before the Ohio Supreme Court, uh, where they were questioning the amount of training required uh, for the practice to be had. Uh, the training set forth by the Ohio Supreme Court in a split decision uh, in June of 2021 was the 730 hours the police officer training uh, that they uh, ruled. Uh, so House Bill 99 came in to clarify that gray area of law. Uh, Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor made it clear uh, in her um, dissent uh, or in her opinion uh, of the case uh, that the legislature had the ability to come in and clarify this gray area of law. Uh, this particular piece of legislation uh, got a lot of attention after being signed into law and after being passed out of the House and Senate and sent to the governor's desk because of the timing. Uh, but let's be very clear, this bill was introduced in February of 2021, going through 18 different versions. The last part that I wanna talk about with House Bill 99 is the part that we added uh, with Senate Bill 168. Uh, Senate Bill 168 and House Bill 99 are combined. Senate Bill 168 is establishing the Ohio School Safety Center and the Ohio Mobile Training Team. Uh, these will be under the Department of Public Safety. Uh, this is allowing for one uh, chief mobile training officer and 16 regional training officers to go in and help schools develop and implement their school safety plans and work with them on bettering their school safety plans. Um, also in that uh, Senate Bill 168, um, school personnel that are gonna be armed will go through an annual background check. Uh, as I've talked about before, we are very passionate um, testimony from both sides of the aisle. Uh, both sides of the aisle want the same thing. They want schools to be safe in the state of Ohio. They just have different ways of getting to that point. Uh, I introduced House Bill 99 and I stand by House Bill 99 because I believe it is uh, the next best option besides having school resource officers uh, in schools here in the state of Ohio to make sure that students and staff are safe and that parents don't have to worry about sending their kids to school. I hope that was five minutes. I'll take any questions that you guys have at this time. Thank you so much, Mr. Hall, for explaining this. And uh, we really appreciate because you put a lot of highlight to the areas that we we had questions and concern. Uh, just want to confirm. So with this bill, it says that it's permissive, it's not a mandate. Um, it's also going to be more uh, maybe appropriate. I mean, the, the school district have the option to to use the bill to suit their school district and the condition that they have in, in their area. I mean, they are in, in those districts, correct? Uh, to uh, uh, I must have representative to the local school. Remember, uh, that is absolutely correct. The the bill uh, sets forth a minimum, but not a maximum. Uh, so if Lakota Local Schools decides to implement this practice uh, and they decide, hey, we would like to have the full 730 hours, heck, we would like to have a thousand hours of training for our teachers to have this practice, that is completely allowed. Uh, there's also uh, been talk, uh, Cincinnati Public Schools uh, was very quick to uh, vote to not do this practice. That is okay. With it being a permissive piece of legislation, uh, we wrote it in a way to allow for the local schools to have local control in making this decision, because let's be honest, local school boards, local communities, they know what's best for their schools. 
Uh, this should not be a state decision. This should be a local control decision. And that's what this bill simply does is giving the power back to the local school boards to make the decision for the safety of their students and staff. So yes. Thank you so much. This is Casper. So you still believe Representative Hall that the, the best safety measure for a school district is having school resource officers? Uh, absolutely. And, and the reason I say that, not because my dad's a school resource officer, but because I do believe in, you know, the training that they've went through uh, with this bill. This is the next best thing uh, for schools in Ohio that don't have that luxury of having a school resource officer. Uh, I won't mention any names. Uh, there's, you know, over 200 schools in Ohio that have had this practice. Some are a lot more public about it than others. Um, but with saying that, um, there's a school in Northeast Ohio. They have uh, 16 armed staff. And I said, 16, I was like, wow, that's kind of a lot. I said, you know, is there a specific reason? Uh, and the, the superintendent informed me that, um, you know, the community's bought into it. Uh, they've been very open about it. Uh, but the most important thing, their county sheriff has two part-time deputies. And on a good day, the average response time is 23 minutes to their school. Uh, so when I, when I talk about this bill, obviously we're in Southwest Ohio in Butler County, um, but this bill affects all of Ohio. This bill affects rural Ohio. This, this bill affects, you know, a lot of the schools that aren't as fortunate as some of the resources we have at schools here, right here in Butler County. Thank you. This is Bodie. Um, the training that um, the Ohio School Safety Center provides, is this free training? And do they come to the schools and do this training? Yes, so right now we are working, it was a very good question. Uh, right now we are working with uh, Director Strickrath and setting up the actual team. Uh, the bill was signed a few weeks back by the governor. Usually it takes about 90 days uh, to go into an effect, but it did have uh, some uh, an appropriation attached to it to get it started a little bit quicker. Uh, the training will be taking place um, with the regionals coming into the schools, working with the schools and working with the staffs. Uh, as far as the cost, um, most of the cost um, at this time are gonna be uh, covered by the state, but there's also gonna be some local buy-in uh, from the school district. It obviously depends on how many staff, uh, it depends on you know how much training you guys would like to go into, but the 24 hours is just the start that we felt like from the state. The governor made it clear in his press conference that he is going to require the full 24 hours uh, and the eight uh, annual hours of training. Uh, one thing I, I should point out really quick, um, somebody taught, somebody asked us, you know, why 24 hours? You know, where'd you come up with 24 hours? Um, it's my opinion, uh, after working this bill for a year and a half, there's not a perfect number of training. Uh, that's why we try to put this decision on the local school boards. Uh, we came up with 24 hours after talking with a lot of the schools that have this practice, uh, some schools do 10 hours, some schools do 20, uh, some schools do 30, 40, 50. They, there's a wide variety of answers that came from that. Uh, but in the 24 hours, we do, we it is pretty well defined um, in working with our friends in the Senate, working with our colleagues in the House, and working with uh, the governor's office. Uh, some things such as de-escalation, mitigation techniques, first aid. Uh, there's also a part in the initial 24 hours and the annual training uh, that deals with scenario-based or simulated training exercises where the teacher's actually carrying the gun, they're walking uh, through these exercises, they're handling the gun, so it's not like we're just giving teachers guns and saying, please go protect students and staff. That is not true at all. We are giving them the training, uh, and we are working with them to make sure that we uh, have this practice as safely as possible in schools. Thank you. Does it train how to stop bleeding and how to... Um... What is that when you cinch the tourniquet. tourniquet, how to use a tourniquet? I believe so under the 24 hours, yes. Okay. Yes. And then do you know, um, what is the, for, for um, Westchester or any bigger city, do you know what the normal response time is for a police officer to arrive at a school? Um, that I don't have those numbers uh, with me today. Um, I would say, you know, we're, we're pretty fortunate here in Butler County. We have a, a great county sheriff's office. We have great local police departments uh, here in Butler County. I'm not saying that because my dad's a part of the county sheriff's yeah. office, uh, but I am, just, you know, knowing those people. Um, I think that, you know, they could all, I, I'll, I'll take the Madison example. Um, you know, Madison was a, a one-off. I remember the day like it was yesterday. 
Um, but you know, my dad being there in seven seconds, um, our local EMS was there treating the patient, uh, in 54 seconds. Uh, the, you know, a lot of the cops were there within probably a minute, two minutes, uh, which is extremely fast. Um, but in these situations, what we've learned, um, and is, is, you know, seconds matter, uh, more than anything. And that's why we put forth this bill, uh, because seconds do matter. We found that in Madison. Um, and I, I just, I really am, am pleased that this bill was signed into law by the governor. Um, because of this bill, I do believe we are going to save lives here in the state of Ohio and protect students and staffs in schools in Ohio. Yeah, I, I would say that seven seconds is pretty impressive. Our schools are a little bit bigger, so that seven seconds might not be more as realistic in some of our our, our bigger uh, buildings. Um, and I know that um, some data that I um, read was that typically the shootings and everything that is included happens within four minutes. So I just, I think we would want to um, kind of just as, as a board figure out the response time for the local deputies. So any further questions? Yeah, with that, but yes, thank you. Paul. Yes, that's it. Right. Thank you. Superintendent Millen. Um, thank you. And thank you, Representative Paul, for being here. And thank you for, I guess, in my mind, clarifying your priority of SROs in the buildings and then going down from there. So I appreciate you clarifying that at the end. And to Mrs. Casper's question, aside from that, I just want to say I appreciate you reaching out to me as things come up, not on this issue, well, aside from this issue, but things that come up across the state or on educational items, you are very good about reaching out saying, this is what I'm hearing. Can you tell me your lens, your perspective? And so I appreciate you, even though we don't agree on everything, I appreciate you asking and having a conversation and then picking up the phone the next time when something comes up as well. So um, appreciate your advocacy and um, your sort of well thought out demeanor. Appreciate that. I, I appreciate that, Superintendent. I have uh, Superintendent Marlon Stiles in my district, so we have a Who? lot of uh, Marlon. <laughs> We're sorry. I heard him. <laughs> so I, I have a lot of good conversation, but it brings up a, a really good point. Um, if I if I may, really super quick, um, we heard a lot of passionate testimony with this particular bill. Uh, we had hundreds of people actually testify uh, against, for, uh, interested in the bill. Um, I actually went through and I read all the testimony. Uh, to make sure that we weren't missing something, make sure that we were covering all of our bases. Uh, because at the end of the day, yes, I wanted to get the signed yeah. in the wall, but I wanted to make sure we did it right. I want to make sure we took our time and had those conversations. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate your words and continue to try and, and go to the experts, go to the local school boards, go to the superintendents uh, on this issue and other variety of issues that affect you and your daily operations here at Lakota Local Schools. Thank you. Mrs. Schaefer, did you have anything? Uh, Yep, two clarifying questions. You mentioned that there were 24 hours of required training. How many of those are required for the simulations that you mentioned? And then my second question is, you stated that we do not have to disclose this to do it. the staff should we decide to do something who are caring, but are we permitted to disclose who the staff is if we wanted to for transparency's sake? Yes, so uh, can you hear me all right before yeah. I... Okay, um, so the 24 hours um, is up to a minimum of 24 hours uh, in the bill, um, but it also says later in the bill that the school board has the ability to go uh, above and beyond the 24 hours. Uh, the governor, what I talked about with the 24 hours, the governor made it clear in his press conference uh, that the, he is mandating that all 24 hours are, are taken um, into effect uh, when this school training uh, center gets set up, when these regional oper operations, regional officers get set up, that schools will have to do the whole 24 hours to have this practice uh, before anybody carries uh, in a school in the state of Ohio. Uh, I mentioned in that 24 hours, there are things such as de-escalation, uh, mitigation techniques, uh, first aid, uh, and then there's the uh, four hours of scenario-based or simulated training exercises and completion of tactical uh, live firearms training. So we, we very we went through this and made sure that we really detailed out what we wanted to accomplish in that 24 hours. Uh, and then to your, your second question, um, could you repeat your second question? I, I kind of was. Sure. Disclosure um, of the staff. Yes. So the, I just want to make sure I heard, I want to make sure I heard the question correct before I. 
Yep. You said we aren't required to disclose the staff members that would be carrying, but are we permitted to disclose the staff members that are carrying? Absolutely. Absolutely. A very good question. I just want to make sure I heard the, the wording correctly. Um, so a part of the school safety plan um, that is not disclosed to the public, that is not a public record uh, at all. You do not have to disclose uh, who is carrying, where they're carrying, um, what they're carrying, or any of the operations you have under your school safety plan. The thing I talked about that was a public record was the resolution or and or the notification that was sent out to the school's uh, community, letting them know that you guys are going to be having this practice uh, in your school district. So nothing else is uh, public record. Uh, everything is still protected by the school safety plan uh, under current law. Thank you. Anything else, Mrs. Schaefer? No. Mrs. Logan. No, I, I think it's always important. And I, I want to say, I respect the fact that you came, you know, this is, there's a lot of feelings, emotions around this topic. And I appreciate that you're standing before the Board of Education and the community and talking about why you stand behind this bill and why you introduced, introduced it. So I appreciate you coming here and having those ongoing open conversations is critical. So thanks for coming. Well, I, I appreciate that. And uh, right after the day after we got this sent to the governor's desk, uh, we had a press conference uh, in Middletown uh, to try and make sure we were getting the right information out to the public of what the bill is actually going to be accomplishing, what we were trying to accomplish uh, when we started the bill versus what we ended up with, uh, with combining 168 into, into 99. So I, I appreciate always having the conversation. Uh, I'm a person that I want, I got sent to Columbus to get things done. I didn't get sent to Columbus uh, just to talk about ideas. I want to actually have results. And this is one of three bills that have already been signed into law for us. Uh, so we hope to continue the momentum with getting stuff done for our constituents here in Butler County and all across the state of Ohio. I'd like to commend your father on his service and on his swift response to that horrific situation. Um, I know that was very difficult for your entire community and many board members that you have here that I've talked to. Uh, Representative Hall, thank you for helping to inform our discussion and our decision making as we talk about what's best for our community. Really appreciate you being here today. I, appreci I appreciate the opportunity. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, board, I'm going to give us a moment. I know that we're going to have a reception. Uh, this is the day when we're saying goodbye to Mrs. Logan. It will be her retirement officially on August 1st. So this is our last board meeting. We don't have closing comments, but I would like to give the board just a moment to say some words in front of the community. We'll be talking about her a little bit later. And um, if you'd like to take just a moment here, we do have a lot on the agenda, so I'd ask you to keep it brief. Who would like to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Um, you know how much we appreciate everything you have done for the district. Um, I've had the pleasure, Jenny, of working with you far more than the last five years when I came on the board. Um, you were actually one of the phone calls that I made before I decided to run for the board. Um, you will be missed um, on a professional level, on a personal level. You've done so much. I lived through the horrible years as a parent and a community member. And what you have done from the time you stepped into this role to now is nothing short of extraordinary. And I know it wasn't easy. And I know it was a lot of hard work. And I also know it was a team effort. So I just really want to thank you and tell you how much you were appreciated and how much you will be missed. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Casper, Mrs. Bodie. Um, so I only really known you for half a year, um, but I do want to say thank you for your time that you've invested into answering my questions and um, catching us up to speed. And um, just thank you for your commitment to your position. And um, I am excited for you on your future endeavors and being able to spend time with your family and be a grandparent. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bodie, Mrs. Schaefer. Uh, I just would like to thank you for your immense commitment to the students, staff, and entire Lakota community. 
you always approach everything with a how might we attitude of it's not a no, it's just reprioritizing to make sure that we are serving everyone to the best of our abilities. And I appreciate that mindset and how you approach things. I also appreciate your integrity and everything you do. We always know that it will be done to the utmost of anyone's ability and with impeccable credentials um, to trust all of our numbers. So thank you for that. And again, as Kelly said, not only have I enjoyed working with you professionally, uh, but also the personal relationship we've forged over these years through your commitment and our shared love of Lakota. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. D. Okay. Um, Ms. Logan, thank you so much for who you are and for what you have done. I've worked with you for short, short, short period. Uh, I came with a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. And like somebody that has a finance background, I thought I knew a lot until when I met you. Um, 10 years of balanced budget is not by accident. I know it's hard work and dedication and thinking outside the box. Uh, we appreciate you. You're going to be missed. And like I earlier said, uh, we have somebody that you mentored before and who work with you up to this point, which I know you have prepared him for continuity. Uh, please, like everybody has said before, don't change your phone number. <laughs> well, and we will need uh, your assistance. I'm going to personally also reach out to you in areas that I might not understand. Not that I don't want to work with Adam, yes. but I know that are things that I'm going to get from you, which is the original. Thank you so much for what you do. We appreciate you and you'll be missed. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Um, I'll be brief, but thank you for thank your you. friendship and your professionalism. Um, and you're going to be hard to replace. Um, I will say too that Lakota is much better place in a much better district than it is now versus when you first came here in a lot of ways. Um, and that's a testimony, testimony to you. Um, also, I also feel like we are lucky to have you as long as we did. And so I know that you were getting calls all the time. And so I'm glad that you um, stayed and uh, we were able to work alongside together with the whole executive team. So thank you. You know, it takes a team to navigate the challenges that we've navigated since your first day here. You came in at a very challenging time, and I am so thankful for your hard work and the difference that you've made in the lives of thousands of students and for our community. You've developed a level of trust. People have faith in your communications and in your leadership, and you've done a, just a terrific job for us. I value you as a colleague and as a friend and you'll be missed. Thank you. Next time I'll just get the Kleenexes out. <laughs> uh, just a couple of things and then we'll move on to the rest of our agenda. We've had a lot of conversation recently about transportation to private schools and had to make some tough decisions for those families. Mr. D and I have had some further conversations about what could we do about that. We've asked Mr. Passage to take a look at some of those issues. And what we understand is some of the options that we would like to employ, we can't based on legislative restrictions that we have. So I've actually asked Mr. Passage to take a look at, is there a possible legislation, legislative solutions that we could employ to be able to do something differently for those families, which we probably won't be able to do anything at this coming year, but we certainly are going to continue to take a look at it and see if there's a way we can solve that problem. And finally, board, just to give you a heads up on something that's going to be happening next week, I was asked by OSB, which is the Ohio School Board Association, to be a representative to an event coming up next week. It's a week-long conference being held at OSU at the John Glenn College of Public Affairs and it's the 2022 Public Leadership Academy. And they bring together seven Republicans and seven Democrats for a week long event together in order to develop civil discourse on different issues that divide us. I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be a challenging week, but looking forward to it. And I'll report back to the board 
after that's over. We'll go ahead and move on to the rest of our agenda, unless there are any questions. Linda, I actually have one thought. If we're looking at potential legislative fixes to our for our private school families, we have also previously discussed if there were optional ways we could provide transportation to 10th through 12th graders and have had legislative issues with that. Could we explore that as well simultaneously? I would think so. We can certainly have the conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. The representative in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and we still have an agenda, so we're going to keep moving. But please take note, Representative. Uh, we've got Representative Gross got in the back and they've Representative got some people back there. You'll be hearing from us. <laughs> All right, Mr. Miller, superintendent, comments? No, just um, at the sake of time, but I um, hope everyone is excited when I say this. We only have 40 days to the start of school. <laughs> How many parents out there are excited about that? <laughs> 40 days to the kids start. Staff is back sooner. So I'm very excited to get the school year started. The summer always goes quickly. It does. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mrs. Logan, comments? Um, we'll, we'll save those for later. But um, I, I guess I would just like to respond that, um, you know, it has been my pleasure. I, I will tell you about five years in, I got the itch and some of the opportunities outside of Lakota were looking pretty good. Um, I am glad I stayed. I do not regret it one bit. I have never um, worked in a place as long as I have in Lakota. And I wasn't sure that I could last as long as I did here, quite honestly. Um, it's challenging, but so rewarding. I, even though I'm I'm not gone, I'm just a phone call away. <laughs> I'm still going to be checking in. Um, and I really am looking forward to spending time with my husband, Rick, my two daughters, Mackenzie and Madison, and my grandchildren, Lalyn and Lenny. And I have a new grandchild on the way. So I'm looking forward to it. So that's exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Logan. Mr. Miller, we'll move to our staffing report. Mr. Kramer is going to cover that for us. I think we have handouts too. Mm -hmm. He's going to go through those. Good afternoon, board. It's good to see everyone. I'm, I'm excited to come here and talk about staffing. We've had plenty of conversations um, over the, the months um, regarding staffing and um, have put together some information that I think is helpful from the perspective of a different background for each of you. Um, some of you were here when cuts were made, some of you weren't. And so what I've tried to do today is to capture uh, a brief history of staffing and what this looks like um, compared to what it used to look like. And so um, just a couple of thoughts first. Um, we all um, know that we are a people business. And so 75 to 85, 85% of our budget is about people. And so um, this is a big ticket item for us. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into staffing. Um, there is a lot of data that goes into staffing and I'm happy to give you additional data that's not presented today. Um, I tried to streamline this to make it um, as efficient as possible. Um, we're gonna take a look back at where we were and then what has happened between where we were and where we are today. And then hopefully we'll have a plan moving forward to um, provide a staffing conversation on a more regular basis so that um, this, is, this is not such a long journey in between. Um, <clears throat> let me make sure I can navigate here. A couple of common terms that I wanted to just make sure we're on the same page with. Um, we use them often, but I just wanted to you know, make sure we're using a common vocabulary. Um, I use the term FTE all the time. That is a full-time equivalent. Um, that is not the number of bodies. It's the number of full-time equivalents. So um, we have people that are partial staff, part-time teachers. We have um, support staff, many of which are not full-time. Um, and we have four categories of employees. We have administrators. We have certified, which includes our teachers. They are in the LEA. We have support staff. 
Um, those are our LSSA folks. And then we have non-represented. Most of the non-represented folks are e either in Ms. Logan's department, my department, technology, um, a few of the extra services. So those work mostly at central office. We also use the term PTR. Um, you guys probably hear about it more directly from parents about how big their class size is. Um, there are some different ratios um, depending on the different circumstances that you may have. Our core classes of math, science, social studies, English, world language, um, those are obviously 7-12 type classes, grade 7 through 12. Um, those are um, typically limited to 27 in a class. Um, you will have variances based on some unique circumstances, but on the average, that's a 27. Um, we have 712 electives. Um, our high school bands do not have 27 kids in a class. They have hundreds. Um, and so the elective programs are a little bit unique um, based on their, their dynamics. The one you're most familiar with is our K-6 homerooms. That is the, my kid has 32 kids in their class conversation. Um, and we have talked about that and we've made some recent changes to that uh, but that PTR is probably the one that most people are familiar with when you talk about um, how many students are in each class. Um, another area that's related to the PTR is our caseload. Um, we have a lot of services that we provide for students, whether that is um, a special education, whether that is reading or for in, in the area of ESL for our ELL learners. Um, and those caseloads are also mandated um, because those people don't have a physical class necessarily. They have groups of kids at different times. And so their caseloads um, vary from um, area to area. Specifically, if we want to look at the current full-time equivalent, um, here is a breakdown of our current um, staff as of, or, uh, from the 2022 school year. We have uh, just over 1,000 LEA FTEs. 1,037, which represents 60% of our, of our personnel. Next would be our support staff. Um, I say support staff, I should probably clarify, we have custodians, we have food service, we have office managers, office secretaries, we have instructional aides. Um, that is the, uh, the bulk of the um, staff members that are in the support staff union, the LSSA, and we have 561 of them making up 32%. So 92% of our, of our people are in front of kids or in front of classrooms or cleaning buildings or, or, or preparing food um, on a daily basis. And we have um, 35 non-represented and 98 administrators currently um, in, the, in our staff. Um, this chart um, I think is a little helpful um, to give you a represented representation of the changes that have happened and by which category. Um, we went back to 2015. There, our data sources are a little bit um, challenging. Ms. Logan and I have worked the last couple of days to, to make sure that this is consistent. Um, we went back to 2015 to give you a snapshot of the changes. Um, obviously, the blue line represents our teaching staff, and you can see the increases that we made, and that will be the focus of today's presentation because it's the largest number, it's the biggest impact, and I think it has the most questions um, surrounding it. The LSSA um, in the orange, you will notice that it also has an increase. Um, I would say that is mostly due to the um, unique needs that we have for individual students. So we have more students that have attendance, we have more um, of our specialized units and special education which require instructional aids. And so as those numbers go up, uh, that the um, number of LSSA members go up. We have not made significant changes to our custodial office managers, food service staff. Um, and then the smaller numbers up there represent the changes in non-reps and administrators. Um, of note, when you look at the non-reps and administrators, we sometimes rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, a non-rep position sometimes becomes an administrator and vice versa. And so collectively that group of of, of folks sometimes um, overlaps with each other. <coughs> Specifically looking at the teaching, the certified staff, which again represents 60% of our, um, our overall staffing, you can see the increase that we have made from 2013 
and having 903 FTEs to current 1,037 FTEs. Uh, my goal today would be to help explain um, the difference between the 903 and the 1,037 so that you can capture where did that come from? Where did the 903 start? Why did it start there? And, and why are we ending at 1,037 as of today? Um, so hopefully along that journey, I will be able to fill in some blanks so that you understand the changes and the decisions that were made um, by the Board of Education throughout that time and what that impact had on staffing. So there are a lot of factors that drive staffing. Um, obviously, student enrollment drives staffing. So um, more students means we need more teachers. Um, specifically, if we have more special needs students, um, we will need more special education teachers. But in general, we also need more students or more teachers for more students, um, regardless of the needs. Um, we have district initiatives and strategic plans, and I'm going to, again, try to fill in some of the blanks, but all of these are important factors when we talk about why we have changed, why we have made decisions, why we have um, either increased or decreased staff in certain areas. Um, obviously, from the, the board perspective, you have community expectations, you have uh, board commitments that followed the levy, levy promises. Um, things happen to us that we can't control. We have unfunded mandates. We are implementing financial literacy to all of the current freshmen as a requirement, which takes another, um, uh, takes additional staff to do that. Um, and so an Ohio revised code changes um, can also have an impact on, on staffing. Specifically to the enrollment question. The total district student enrollment from 2010 to 2022 is on the, on the screen um, currently. Back in 2010, um, recently we, we have talked um, that enrollment is increasing and we're increasing. We are increasing as you can see by the right side of the graph, but we are not to the place where we were back in 2010. Um, there is clearly a significant dip from 2011 to 2014. At that time, there was cuts that were made to programs, um, whether this is just a natural drop in enrollment or people made decisions based on those cuts to send their students and their children somewhere else. Um, that probably is a little mixed bag. Um, but while we're on the increase right now, um, we, are, we are clearly still coming back from a, a dip that happened back closer to when um, we were discussing levies, we had uh, failed levies. Um, and then obviously it took a little bit of time to start to implement some things, which is when I think you see the increase in student enrollment. Um, specifically, I mentioned also that the, the special education um, community and the number of students is also increasing. Um, I need to explain this graph a little bit um, to help to help kind of connect the dots here. Um, each of those colored bars represent a different category of student. Category one with a, a special education student with the smallest number of needs to the green, which is category six, which is the highest needs. A few months back, Ms. Longworth spoke about the special education programming and discussed how this has changed. Um, this is a representation of how that has changed in numbers. Um, you can see from 2010, we were around a total of 1,400 students um, to 2021, and we cut off in 2021 for other factors, which um, would take a little while to explain, which has to do with um, state funding. But um, over the, the course of 2010 to 2021, um, we have increased over 280 students in the specifically in special education. Um, case loads for special education students can vary somewhere between six or eight for our highest need students, up to 16 to 24 for our regular special education students. So 280 students is a significant increase in staffing. Um, very specifically to the top box, which is the green, our highest need special education students number um, represented 12% of our total special ed population in 2010. 
and it now represents 17% of our total population. And again, those are our students that have the, the highest level of needs, which I think is a reflection of the programs that we offer and the supports that we offer, uh, because I believe that attracts people to us. Um, but that is uh, has a tremendous impact on staffing because those are very small caseloads of, of students. And so um, when the total increase of, of students is 20%, but um, it, the highest impact is in our highest needs kids, it is going to be a, a tremendous factor. Um, uh, moving forward, um, to connect the dots a little bit, when you see a graph that has a number of special education students, I think when you can look specifically at the special education staffing, you can see how the special education staffing has mirrored the increase in students. So um, we had slightly just below 165 special education students, uh, special education teachers, and we are now um, bordering on close to 190. Now, I would like to make a couple of notes um, specific to this um, regarding preschool. Um, many years ago, there was a decision that we would um, give our preschool program to Butler County Educational Service Center. And we still have that commitment with Butler County Educational Service Center. Um, in the recent years, we have taken back part of the staffing of that. And specifically, we took back the related services. So related services are um, uh, PTs, OTs, uh, speech language pathologists, psychologists. And the reason we took back those specific staff members was that those preschools were in our buildings. And so we were able to utilize the staff with our kindergarten, first and second grade uh, more efficiently having our own staff members um, connected to the preschool. So um, that was an additional nine staff members. So um, while that's an increase in staffing, it would be a decrease in the preschool budget that we would have through Butler County. So um, it's, it's, um, it's reflected in our staff count. Um, what's not represented here is the impact that it had, the negative, uh, well, I guess it's a positive impact on the Butler County budget for the preschool. <clears throat> All right, so um, one of the other factors that I said played into staffing were the district initiatives and strategic plans. So along this timeline, um, and I'm going to divide, um, I'm going to look specifically at these um, benchmarks of 2010, 2012, and 2017. 2010, uh, we were focused on pending financial concerns. 2012, we really took some deep cuts. You could see that's where the enrollment was dropping as well. And then 2017, um, I will call this the Miller plan for lack of a better term. That is when Mr. Miller came and we're glad he's here. Um, so in 2010, what did we look like? So in 2010, our PTR in our kindergarten through fourth grade was at 24.3. Our PTR in our fifth and sixth grade, 25.4. Our students had a special in grades K through six every day, art, PE, music, or unified arts. We had a certified teacher as a media specialist. Um, you may call them a librarian in each building. Um, our seven through 12th grade students and teachers had a seven bell schedule. The, uh, the average range for our PTR in our high school and junior high classes was 18 to 24 students. Um, financial issues and levy failures resulted in some initial cuts. Um, I've tried to capture these based on some buckets of types of teachers, um, certified teachers. Again, I'm just doing um, the certified staff today. Um, we cut 14 and a half reading specialists. Those librarians, 10 of them, they were cut. Gifted was cut, literacy coaches, and three and a half assistant principals. Um, what that resulted in was a mixed bag. We had some traveling ass assistant principals. We had media specialists that worked in multiple buildings. Um, the gifted services were, were spread thin. Um, our, our teachers weren't getting the literacy coaches that they were getting before. Um, and so um, you can see that was pretty significant. However, it pal pales in comparison to the additional cuts that followed. 
So in March of 2012, these major cuts were announced. Um, in kindergarten through sixth grade, for the students went from having five specials per week to one special per week. That resulted in a reduction of 37.8 FTEs. We cut art, we cut music, PE, and unified arts. So our students remained with their homeroom teacher, if you will, for the majority of their day and the majority of their week. They got out to specials once per week. In the seventh and eighth grade in our junior high buildings, we dropped from seven bells to six bells. The student day went from six and a half hours to six hours. Um, we did a restructuring of our Butler Tech courses. We did reduction in art and music. At the same time, some of the high school electives were moving down as part of the junior high electives. That result, um, and uh, before I say the net result, the PTR was increased to 27. So prior I had said the, the range was somewhere between 18 and 24. Our class sizes at the junior highs went up to 27. When you do all the math on that, um, just over 25 FTEs to make that change and that those cuts happen. In the ninth through 12th grade, our student day went from six hours and 39 minutes to six hours and five minutes. We knocked off a credit that students needed to graduate. Uh, we increased the PTR just like we did at the junior high to 27. And that was a net of 45 FTEs that were cut across the district. And then things changed and things started to change and they changed um, slowly. But in fall of 2013, the levy passed and then we started to implement some of the levy promises that were made. Um, we improved our safe and secure entrances. That's seven additional SROs. They are not in this FTE count anywhere. Um, we changed our facilities. We improved our facilities, our cleaning and the maintenance departments. We um, added back part of the promise, which I think was 12 at the time, and we did six technology um, support um, staff members. We, we added back instructional coaches at a total of six. At that point, we went back to a, a new expanded bus service. Again, not an FTE, but it was a promise that was made and, and was changed moving forward, likely for the 2014, 2015 school year. Um, we reduced the extracurricular participation fees and we added back one special per week, which was four FTEs, and we implemented a seven period day at the ninth grade. So one of the reasons for that was because we still had the six bells, 10, 12, um, the seven period day allowed them to take some of the electives to, to take some of the pressure off. And so um, that was strategically done. We cre at, created our freshman buildings that have seven period days. Um, another, uh, then we moved beyond that and we, and these are some other additional ads that we have had along the way. Most of these are part of Mr. Miller. Some of them have happened, um, just prior to him. Um, we implemented all day kindergarten. Um, so if we go back and you, and you, and you take out of all the staffing numbers, the kindergarten in 2013, 14, we needed 23 and a half because the majority of the kids were only here for half a day. Until And to this point now, we have 52 FTEs. So um, adding back all day kindergarten, which I believe was not a levy promise, but was something you heard about on a regular basis. And we discussed and we talked about um, resulted in 28.5 additional FTEs. We returned everyday specials to the elementary. Um, this was 21 FTEs. We had this as a discussion as we built a new elementary schedule. We reconfigured the district from K-1 and 2-6 to K-2 and 3-6 buildings. Um, and we built schedules that allowed for specials every day. The additional specials um, you know, involve tech and STEAM. And so we have art, music, PE, which are K-12. And then we have others that are just in our K-6 um, programs. Um, Personalized instruction. One of the tenets of our district strategic plan is personalized instruction. Um, we've developed a career readiness academy, which is our alternative school, and we continue to develop that, which will turn into Lakota Central here in the next school year. 
Um, that is, uh, that's eight and maybe more FTEs for next year, but right around eight to nine FTEs. Um, an additional commitment that was, was made was to one-to-one -one devices for students. Um, we did not wanna put devices in students' hands and not have teachers prepared to utilize them. So the commitment there was to put innovation specialists. These are our trained teachers. They are curriculum experts, they are tech experts, and they are the folks that are providing um, professional development and support to our teaching staff to utilize the one-to-one -one devices that are now in the hands of our students three through 12. That is a total of 73.9 um, FTEs. A very recent decision was to change the um, class sizes and the PTR specifically at the kindergarten through six buildings. Um, at the main campuses and the, and the junior highs, we are still maintaining 26 to 27 students in a class. Um, we do simple tallies in March. Um, Mr. Vogelman and I um, take the number of kids that have requested classes, we divide by 27, and that is how we determine how many sections we need and how many teachers we need. Um, that, has, that has remained consistent from, from when we had the cuts. The PTR at our grade levels is, is this as of yesterday. So um, we did that same math for our younger kids. We did 26 to 27 in a class. We divided it out. How many first grade teachers did we need? And I think you are um, probably have the marks or bruises from when those numbers went higher than 26, 27, 28. Um, so we have made a commitment to um, honoring your request to uh, readjust the class sizes. And as of today, we are closer to the range of that is that we determined um, in the most recent um, administrative guidelines. So um, of note, kindergarten will not remain at 19.5 because there's a lot of kids who haven't registered yet. When they register, they'll fill in the blanks um, in the kindergarten sections. Um, before I move to the next one on where we are today, um, I can say that for next school year, um, I tried to capture this up through the 22 school year, but I know for the next school year, um, due to the PTR changes, um, we will have six additional K-6 teachers. We will have four ESL teachers, and we will have three special ed teachers. That is based purely on numbers, whether that's a PTR or the number of students that are enrolling or have um, the needs in special education. There will be a few others um, every year. Math will go up by a half and science will go down by a half, but um, those, will be, those will be somewhat flat. Um, one question that has come up um, on, a, on a regular basis is how are we handling the great resignation? Um, you can't turn on the TV or open up a newspaper and not hear about the economy and the workforce and can't find people to do the jobs. Um, I am happy to share with you that um, the resignations and retirements that we have um, currently happening specifically to our LEA um, is really not out of line with where um, we have been traditionally. Um, you will see on this graph that um, back in 2011, 2012, we had 10% of our LEA. Now, remember, the LEA had 903 students, so, um, or 903 teachers. So the percentage of, of people who are retiring or resigning um, has um, declined. It went back up this year, and I think we're all aware of why, um, but the, the numbers are, are not saying anything like everyone's running and screaming from Lakota. I believe it's exactly the opposite. We are more of a destination district for employees than not. When I started here, it was very common for um, us to hear um, four people were going to Mason and three were going to Sycamore and you could fill in the blanks with every other place that was east and outside of Butler County and um, that's not happening. We do not get that information. We have people that get promoted to those positions, um, what, you know, as an administrator or things of that nature. But um, we're, we're not we're not seeing that on a regular basis. Um, I did include here because I think it's of of note because it's probably our most challenging area of 
jobs to fill is our LSSA. So it is harder and harder to find people to work in the food service, um, custodians, and very specifically to the instructional aides that work with our challenging kids. Some of those units is, are, are very difficult work. Um, uh, we have some uh, you know, behaviors that are difficult to manage. We have some outbursts, things that are just um, take, take people with a lot of patience to do. We have um, done some contract work so that those people are paid higher to try to um, incentivize them. Um, but I did include the resignation and retirements because you can see we have an uptick going on right now, but it is still um, far below um, what happened in some of those years prior. Um, some of the high peaks is typically connected to the STRS or SERS resignate or retirement language and incentives. So, um, and finally, I'm trying to scoot through because I, I know we have an agenda here. Um, moving forward, um, I have heard loud and clear and Jenny and I have spoken numerous times about what this looks like moving forward. Um, uh, it would be my goal to you know, define the data points that are important to you um, as a board of education so that we can report on them um, in a more succinct um, way. Um, whether that's on a board agenda or whether that's an addendum to um, each uh, each uh, board agenda so that um, I believe you see a lot of things called new on the board agendas and it raises eyebrows. And when I get to explain them to you, you're like, oh, well, that's not really new, Rob. And so how, how can we do that better so that you are clear as to what is new? Um, and when we pr make proposals, whether that's a curriculum or a special ed or uh, something from Mr. Miller, uh, that we are connecting what that directly means each time um, that proposal is being made as part of the staffing con conversation. So um, I also think um, there will be some conversations that will need to be had as we look at our new strategic um, plan and we look at our master facility plan, um, there will be staffing um, implications to having fewer buildings. Um, you can certainly be more efficient if you have bigger buildings. And so we have some time to build in that through attrition as people are retiring. So the teachers out there don't panic. Um, we'll, that, that will be part of the work that we will do to um, you know, make sure our staffing plan aligns to those new projects and new buildings. And with that, I will do my best to answer any questions that you have. Like I said, um, if there are specific data, um, if there's specific data, I'm happy to um, pull that together for you, share that to the entire board um, in whatever fashion is most understandable. I get it because I look at it all the time. And so I need to make it so that's clear for you guys. Mr. Kramer, thank you for the historical look. And Mrs. Logan, I know you spent a tremendous amount of time on this as well. Uh, thank you for the historical look and the level of detail that you've provided to us. I think it's important to understand that and to also understand the impact on students on those changes. I, I will say the board literally just received this at this meeting. So I would like to reserve the ability for the board to have further discussion on this at a future board meeting. I, especially as we have a discussion about um, budgets and deficit spending and that kind of thing. So I'm going to just, I'm going to give a quick opportunity for questions, but I do want to stick on the agenda because we're already past our, our ending time. So let me offer that opportunity for just a quick round, Mr. Adeem. Yes, um, I know we are pushed for time, but I'm going to make a request. Sure. Um, student achievement is very, very important to me. And uh, I believe that early stage of uh, the kids is very crucial. So looking at the numbers, uh, PTR first and second, I know the 24.6 and 25.1, and PTR third and fourth, 25.7 and 25.7. I want to know if it is within the range, if compared to other schools in the state, Okay. Or 
but it might not, you don't need to answer it today. Fine, right. take time because we don't have time right now. But I want to know that because it's very crucial in the education of our kids. Good question, Mr. D. Yep. You've got that, Mr. Kramer? Yeah, state, com basically compared to similar districts, state yeah. averages. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Schaefer, any questions? Um, I would just perhaps if we could post this to board doc so we would have it for future reference as well as for our community to be able to see and just to thank you because I think this was excellent data and helpful as far as you had asked about frequency that would be most helpful to the board. I personally feel like if we did a presentation like this once a year, it would be helpful, but perhaps we could quarterly get some updates of any changes that are just, you know, this is the change since last time would be my thought on that. Thank you, Mrs. Schaefer. Mrs. Bowden. So I say that you're, I hear that you're saying that this is normal, um, that we are not above any average of people leaving. But when I look at the data that you provided today and the data that is um, provided by board docs uh, approved personnel items, I'm looking at the percentages that I quickly did while you were giving your presentation. And so in 2017, it was a 5.4% of just the admin and the um, non-reps. The admin and then what's the next one? The non-represented. The non-represented staff. No, the like the teachers and um, certified sorry, staff. Certified, certified staff. Sorry, um, the certified staff. So I did the percentages of people that have left versus the people that were here. I think this is something that you suggested at the last board meeting, Kelly. So it was a 5.4 percent had left in 2017, 4.6 percent in 18. 2019 was a 6.3, so that was that summer, there was a lot of people that had left. Um, and then in 2020, there was a 4.3%, 2022, 4.2, but halfway through the year, we are already at 62, 6.3%, which is the same as 2019, but we have yet the rest of the year to be applied. And we have 70 people who have left so far. So um, to clarify that data, so the, the data that I would run for the 21-22 school year resignations would have started in August of 21 and just ended. So that the last six months is the last six months of the window of time. Mm -hmm. So it's not a calendar year. So your six months is the end of my six, is the end well, of 12 you, months. If you could get me that information year to year, that would be. And I, that is, um, we have that. That's what built the chart. So we have the resignations and retirements for all LEA and LSSA from 2011 to 2022. And I, I don't know if I've I've shared that, but I don't know if it's been shared with you directly, but absolutely. But still, when I look at the numbers, so say we just, those percentages you're saying, those should not apply. The percentage, the numbers still are 55, 47, 68, 43, 48, and now 70. So there is a considerable amount of people leaving, and I just would like more feedback on why that is happening. And I would like to motion that the board directs administration to draft a set of questions for exit interviews, and then the administration present it to the board um, on August 8th. So this is the motion. So there is a motion on the floor. Is there a second to the motion? What is, what is the motion? Exit interview questions. Hearing no second, the motion dies. Mr. Kramer, when you're providing that information, a comparison to how similar other districts are doing would probably be helpful to us. Is it across? Are you talking, are you connecting um, I'm, resignations I'm, and um, yes, retirements retirement. to class sizes, same comparison? Yeah, no, we can do similar that. districts, how many people are yeah. resigning? Yep. Yeah. Can, Across that same time frame that Mrs. Bodie has referenced. I don't know if that number exists, but I will find out. I will ask my colleagues whether they share or not. We um, appreciate it. And a ballpark is fine. Yep. Thank you. Anything further, Mrs. Bodie? I believe that's all. Thank you. Mrs. Casper. Um, thank you, Rob, for this detailed information. I agree with Mrs. Schaefer. A quarterly update on staffing would be helpful. And also, if there's a major change that comes prior to the quarterly update that we get. Um, and just a really quick question, because I would be remiss for all the parents out there listening to this. Do we, ha I mean, the 19.5 in K-1 is a beautiful number. Like you said, we all know that that will not stay that way. 
do we have a plan for when that number gets above the target? I know the problem is space in some buildings. We literally don't have a space to put another classroom. So, but so we, the, the number of staff members in the kindergarten are set um, based on the last year's number of sections. Okay. And so if we exceed that, which we don't anticipate, but if we did exceed it, um, then we would work, whether it's with Chris Bissarge on the facilities and, and finding a space, um, the principals, as they get close, will talk with me. And if they're taking their class list and saying, we're going to divide them up into eight teachers, but we might have nine, they're doing parallel work so that if August 1st comes and we need to add the section, they can add the section and they can implement the nine teachers versus the eight. Okay. So, um, because we know that number is going to change. We do. We do. And we also have uh, some phase in days for our kindergarten students so that the, the kindergarten class list is not necessarily firm right. when the kids walk in the door and we have a few days of testing and half the kids come. And, and so the purpose there would be then to allow us to make sure that they're evenly distributed right. and we would have the number of sections okay. so that those extra days of phase in for them is helpful in that regard. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kramer, just a very quick question. And then again, I'm sorry, Matt. I know you like the last words. I just wanted to cut in real fast if that's okay. Rob, can you, I mean, we're 40 days out. Can you mention how many unfilled positions we have just so people know? Um, at the moment, we posted Title I positions on this past Friday. Title I positions are um, federally funded and we get the money late. And so we hire what we call long-term subs. So those are hires that we have after July 1st. We posted, we filled 15 of those last week and we have seven left. That is very typical. We don't typically hire the Title I teachers until even August. Um, and we posted two first grade and a fifth grade and principals from both buildings called me while I was here um, with selections or needing guidance for the next step. So in the teaching world, uh, very few of the, really what we're waiting on is our title positions. LSSA, instructional aides, attendants, anybody who wants to work with students, whether that's food service or custodial, we'll, we'll, we would have places for them, for sure. I think too, thank you for that. I think too, another point to note for all of us is that in terms of STRS, they just made a change in retirement age for teachers and administrators where um, previously until just a couple of weeks ago, it was age 60. Um, so essentially teaching 38 years, they have now rolled that back down to 35 years of service. So we will see more retirements coming right. because of people in that 35 to 38 year right. time frame, which is even more of a, a concern in terms of making sure we get staff, staff preparation. Sure. And, and that may align with building changes as well. Right. Um, but yeah, anybody who's not didn't qualify for the retirement by 2026, the requirement to stay till 60 has been dropped. So 2026 might be a 2027 might be a really big year. And we have seen those cyclical changes based on STRS over the years. That's not unusual. So two very quick questions, if yep. I could. I believe in the past we did do an optional exit interview email kind of thing out to our staff, but it was optional. Are we still doing that? We do not. Okay. And do you have any concerns about staffing at this point in time toward Mrs. Bodie's point? No, I don't. I, the only concern I would have is filling some of our hard to fill attendant positions. Um, we're six, six weeks out, five weeks out. Um, we probably have 10 positions left. I don't think that's insurmountable, but um, it's certainly an area that we're, we're focusing on. And I think your point about those are difficult positions because they're challenging. They are challenging roles, and we certainly appreciate those. And the middle of the day on the food service ones are all in the middle of the day, like at eleven two two. Yeah, food, some of the food service are. Yep, it's a hard. I think I each have, one has some some challenges to it. And I have so, a final question. Whenever you go ahead. Okay. So again, as the as the HR director with the seventy leaving, can you speak to any possible reasons why that is happening, and what practices do you have in place currently, since we do not have an exit interview, and um, how do you determine whether or not you have a problem with possible 
principles or buildings? And how are you determining whether there is a problem with your staffing or not? Um, I think our, our, our the, the question about whether it's about a principal or not, I'll have to answer separately. Um, our principals have a very good sense of what's happening in their building. So when we hear uh, a teacher is quitting or a teacher is moving, um, you know, we know they know why that's happening. Um, oftentimes when I ask, they're like, Rob, this she's just not happy. She's got to go to she got to drive too far. Um, we've had numerous people have said, I can't keep driving as far. Um, as, I, as I'm driving today, I need to work closer to home. So um, I believe our principals have a very good um, sense for what's happening in their building. Um, if it is specific about a principal, um, and I have had those occasionally that I have brought up to the executive team, um, hey, we got a lot of openings in this building. Um, anybody have some concerns? We look at the, we look at each department, we look at curriculum, we, we meet as an executive mm -hmm. team and we discuss um, if there's any anything we need to be looked at, looking at, um, I don't have any of those currently. Um, I don't have any concerns. You know, there's ebbs and flows. I think uh, you mentioned East had a whole bunch. Well, um, I think I know why each of those East people left, and I don't 11. think it was because they were unhappy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a lot of those things happen, and they are cyclical. But um, you know, we've transferred 135 to 140 people into new jobs because they wanted to go from west to east or they wanted to go to fifth grade to sixth grade. Um, so um, I, when I see those number of moves, that's not people that are unhappy with Lakota. That's not, they're not, you know, displeased with being employed by us. Um, they want a different challenge. And sometimes that means staying home. Sometimes that means moving closer to work, their spouse moves. Um, but um, at this time, I don't have any um, glaring concerns um, that I'm aware of. So it sounds like you do have anecdotal data. I've got a lot of district. it up here, but a lot of conversations with principals. <laughs> right. Like, hey, is there something going on? And they're like, no, Rob, this is, you know. And, and Mr. Miller has said the same. I'm, I'm sure, yeah, and he, he would get them too. Well, as, as a manager, when I managed stores and I had management underneath me as well as employees, um, I didn't just take the word of my managers. And so when I would say, when they would say, I believe, or you say, I believe, that means you believe, but that it's not necessarily the fact. So I, I could say, I believe that it would be smart for our teachers to carry, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a good idea or that we um, 100% understand, you know, the full impact. But what I'm saying is, when you say, I believe, and it's in your head, that does not necessarily give us validation that there is a valid reason for 70 people leaving within the first half of the year. I'm still concerned with that. It is concerning with me. And as, as someone who is responsible for the district and who has to answer to, to that, I would like to implement some type of um, exit interview. Um, and I cannot stress that enough because if anything, that would make me realize there is no issues. There are no issues that we have to be aware of, but I am not confident of that because I have nothing to look at and it's just hearsay. And I like to see things on paper and I like to, and I like factual things. And that's why I keep presenting this because I think if anything, if there's nothing to be worried about, then it's going to shut me up, <laughs> so to speak. So we'll take a look at it. Thank you, Mrs. Bodie. I'm going to move us along. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. We appreciate the information and Mrs. Well, Logan and all those who assisted in gathering that. We'll move to treasurer's recommendations on our action items, number seven, and I'll take a motion to A, approve the minutes and B, approve the monthly financial reports for the month ending June, 2022. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Casper. Second. Thank you, Mr. AD. Discussion? Mrs. Logan. Mrs. Casper. Yes. Mr. Adi. Yes. Mrs. Bodie. Yes. Mrs. O'Connor. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you. Superintendent recommendations, action items, A, approved personnel items. I'll take a motion. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Casper. The chair will second. Second. I beat you to it, Mr. Adi. <laughs> Or the yeah, chair and that's all right. <laughs> Discussion. Mrs. Logan. 
Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. Mr. Adi? Yes. And Mrs. Bodie? Yes. We move to the portion of our meeting for public comments. Number nine, we have 30 minutes for public comment. We have several people signed up today. Please remember the following, three minutes. We're trying to get everyone in that would like to speak. When you see the timer turn yellow on the screen, please wrap up your comments so that when it turns red, you are done. We ask that you direct your comments to the board and to the chair. <coughs> ask that you not name staff or board members individually. And I'm going to call three people at a time and ask that you line up so that we can move this through as efficiently as possible. And we will start with Maureen Mowell and following her, Alyssa and Tony Kruger will be after that. Please state your name. And again, pay attention to our timer. Hello, I am Maureen Mao. I am one of the uh, founding board members of Lakota Cares, whom you guys hopefully know at this point because we've spoken a few times. Um, I also handed out a handout earlier. Mr. Miller passed it around. Um, I'm here because we have 40 days until the start of school. And um, for a lot of our students that have learning disabilities or just learn differently, on IEPs 504s, it can be a pretty stressful time. And so one of the things we did is we reached out to our community to say, what are some, some, what are some suggestions that we could um, give to our schools? Because um, we want to not just say, here's a problem, here's a problem, here's a problem, but hey, here are some solutions that may be easy to implement, maybe take a little bit more time. And so I wanna share some of those recommendations that came from our community on how we can help all of our students and especially those who maybe have anxiety or have different <clears throat> learning needs, um, similar to my daughter, that could be helpful. So one of the first recommendations was social stories. And if you don't know what that means, it could be as simple as saying, having a PDF that gets emailed out, it doesn't have to be printed, where it shows a picture of all the adults that, you're, that the child might be interacting with. Um, it could be something as easy as um, including who their intervention specialist is, their OT, PT, who their specials are. I think of my daughter who will be going into first grade who doesn't have an IEP and is in a typical classroom environment. She would benefit from something like this where she could actually see who that person is. It might mean that the schools have, as, as teachers come in or as um, instructors come in, hey, let me get your picture really quick and put it on a drive. And then you can quickly just put it on a document that gets sent out sent out to parents. Um, I know for my daughter who is nonverbal, she uses social stories to really help her have a feel for who's safe, for who she can encounter. And a lot of times it's me asking and saying, um, can we create something? Can we create a social story? And we get them, but I think about those parents and those families out there that maybe don't think to ask. And this is just something simple that we can give all students a leg up on. Um, we got a lot of feedback about open houses. <clears throat> open houses are really hard for our students. And honestly, a lot of our kids tend to opt out of them because it's too overwhelming. You have so many kids, so many things going on. And so having some sort of sensory friendly option for students, whether it's opening up 30 minutes prior to the school, um, school open house happening or something else. Um, we'll need to ask you to wrap up. Yep. So you can see the other options, communicating SEC um, names because they're not on hack, offer summer tours, or having teachers follow up with a phone call later on. So there's some suggestions. Please let me know if you have any questions or want to follow up. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this is Lu Luigi. <laughs> Mr. Kruger will follow and Terry Cunningham, please join the lineup. Uh, all right. uh, Alyssa Luigi, I'd like to address some concerns I have about staffing after talking to multiple teachers in the district across grade levels and subjects. I am focusing on a few major points here, but please look for an email with additional information because I got a lot of feedback. Classes must start the beginning of the year at the low end of the class size range to accommodate growth. A range is meaningless if it isn't for the entire school year. 
where there is his, when there is historical data showing class sizes that repeatedly exceed ranges by mid-year, <clears throat> it indicates that Lakota does not believe that these ranges really matter. Additionally, high school class sizes are unacceptably large in some cases. Ceramics teachers this coming year will have to find space to store seven to eight more projects per bell, so 50 plus projects. Metals classes use grinders and buffers, soldering tools, et cetera. There are legitimate safety concerns to having seven more kids in a classroom working with these things. The only way to ensure safety is to sacrifice the quality of some programs. Why is the district okay with sacrificing quality in the name of opportunity? My oldest daughter is a rising senior. The last year that Lakota had a full year long specials classes with a dedicated teacher in each building was when she was in first grade. Elementary and ECS specials teachers shuttle between schools, hampering their ability to develop relationships with students. They are frequently shifted between schools from year to year as well. Students deserve better than what Lakota has offered them in these areas since 2011. Finally, respect for teachers. Members of this board have repeatedly made inappropriate and unfounded accusations at our teachers. Thank you, Mr. Miller, for defending the staff against these attacks. However, I have concerns in other areas about how this district values the input from departments and teachers. Some of the central office staff have made unilateral decisions without input from the departments and teachers these decisions affect. I have seen it happen in gifted programming over the past 12 years, thankfully less so with current gifted staff. And I know it has happened in other areas also. See my previous comment about high school art class sizes. Administration needs to input to make the best decisions, especially in areas outside of their personal background. Additionally, the board should allow staff to speak at board meetings, regardless of where they live. I am asking the board and the administration to do better for the students and staff going forward. And Jenny, enjoy your retirement. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. <clears throat> Mr. Kruger is up. Mr. Or Terry Cunningham will follow. Mr. Argo, please join the lineup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can we give me two and I'll give one to Mrs. Casper? Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Mr. Argo will follow and Mrs. Erdl, if you'll join the lineup. Thank you very much for um, your time and your service. I um, just gave you a handout and uh, I'll read the quotes from it. It's from the National Education Association and some of the meetings and resolutions that they have um, proposed. In 2019, the NEA resolution stated, and I quote, Using existing resources, NEA will incorporate the concept of white fragility into NEA trainings, staff development, literature, and other existing communications on social gender, LGBTQIA, and racial justice. In 2021, the NEA voted to promote critical race theory. They stated, and I quote, to share and publicize information already available on critical race theory. Have a team of staffers for members who want to learn more and fight back against anti-CRT rhetoric. Quote, provide an already created study that critiques empire, white supremacy, anti-blackness, anti-indigenity, racism, patriarchy, cis-heteropatriarchy, capitalism, 
ableism, anthropocentrism, and other forms of power and oppression at the intersections of our society, and that we oppose attempts to ban critical race theory and or the 1619 project. That was from July of 2021 in their national conference. Um, that's a bit disturbing in that if those members of the NEA are against capitalism and they're against what's the foundation of our country and several other aspects that you heard. I don't relish the issue that you have to deal with in CRT. I wish you the best on it. And I hope that this September we have a great Constitution Day and that my grandchildren will be able to answer all the questions about the Constitution and I'm going to ask them. So I hope you have a good program. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Kruger. Mr. Argo is up. Mrs. Ertl follows. Mrs. Redke, if you'll join the lineup. Uh, hello. hello. All right. So there's a couple things I... Mr. Uh, Argo, yep. I know I said your name, but would you say it for the tape? Uh, Alex Argo. Um, like so there's a few things I wanted to hit on. A couple things came up during the meeting. Um, so we obviously all want our, our kids to be safe in school. Uh, at the last board meeting, uh, our, our administration spoke out against arming teachers in the school district. Uh, it was pointed out that the administration believes that SROs are the best option to protect our children. Uh, we heard from many in the community, some parents, some teachers, and they unanimous, unanimously at that meeting said that they were not in favor of arming teachers. We heard from a survey of the teachers that the teachers are not in favor of being armed. The governor put out a statement saying that if the schools have SROs, that's the best case scenario and we don't need to arm the teachers. Uh, even the bill sponsored today said that same exact thing. With the increased SRO presence the district has committed to recently, I would hope that we can put this conversation to bed. Uh, why not put a resolution doing so for the time being so we can stop bringing this up at every single meeting? Uh, there's a lot of people who are very concerned about this. Um, uh, another thing, a concern that was brought up today has been about the high number of resignations. Uh, Lakota East has been mentioned a couple times. Um, from my perspective, I, I might offer that there's there was a trespassing incident in that building that might have contributed to some of those resignations. Just my personal thoughts. Um, but mainly I wanted to talk about uh, Mrs. Logan's retirement. Um, so a month or so ago, I pulled up the oldest five-year forecast video that was available on the CODA's YouTube page for fun, uh, which happened to be from October of 2017, which Miss Logan was just talking about at the meeting today, which was kind of funny. Um, so there is some vintage 2017 uh, haircuts, some interesting uh, <laughs> facial hair trends. Uh, so I, I'd recommend taking a look if you're bored sometime. Um, I think not, Mr. Argo. <laughs> I only want to go back five years. But <laughs> but uh, Mrs. Logan talked about a lot of the history that we heard we heard about today, um, but she also went on to forecast that we would continue into 2022 and maintain the five-year balanced budget for another 10 to complete a 10-year balanced budget. And here we are today. She was right on the money with no more tax levies. Uh, one thing that she did say that struck me was she asked, what does 2022 look like for Lakota? Should it just be the status quo? And she said, nothing about this district says that, that we want to stay status quo. And I think in big part, thanks to Ms. Logan, over the last five years, we have seen great things in Lakota. So thank you for your service. You've been anything but status quo. You've left, you've left the district in fantastic financial shape and you will be sorely missed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Argo. Mrs. Erdl. Linda Darby. Hello, good afternoon. I'm, I'm sorry, one oh. moment. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. okay, 
one minute. Uh, Mrs. Redke will follow, and Mrs. Ms. Wyatter, you'll be up next. Mrs. Ertle. Now you can go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to to say your happy name. summer. Oh, yes, Christy Ertle. Sorry, <laughs> Liberty Township. Um, I just wanted to, you know, reflecting upon the last twelve months of meetings. Um, I've been at many of them, and I wanted to say a couple points, just reflecting on a few things. Um, I think the direction, Mr. Miller, that you um, are proposing regarding the audit is a step in the right direction, and I just want to say thank you for that. Um, I think there's just been so much heat and contention regarding CRT and if it's in our district, if it's not in our district, and I think the audit is a step in the right direction. So I do commend you on that. Um, I think we all have to take a step back and I, I just wanted to share my heart today. And I think I, fe I feel the need to stay in the gap for the kids, right? Not the parents. We know there's a lot of contention and we've been here, we've experienced it the last 12 months. Um, if you take that amount of passion and that amount of frustrations on both sides of this argument, I think all of us will agree that it's not good. And whether CRT is in our district or not in our district or whatever this audit shows, my heart today is that as adults, we can stand in the gap for the kids and realize that that's not a good thing in our classrooms. And if we as adults can't handle the emotion and the passion on both sides, I think we need to take a step back and think about what does that look like in a classroom all the way in our elementary schools to our high schools, right? So my opinion of CRT, it really doesn't even matter. That's not why I'm up here, but I think we have to, to remember what this argument is all about. And I think in the process of the last 12 months, when I you know go through videos and really reflect on <clears throat> the conversations that have been at this microphone, very passionate, heated conversations, that's the element that's missing. And so I just wanted to stand up today and say that um, regardless of whatever happens with the audit, I think we need to make a determination as a district, are we going to allow it or are we not going to allow it, right? And that's really the question that I feel like has been missed in all the debates on both sides of this controversial topic. And so my heart today is that whatever happens with this audit that we can take a step in the right direction for our kids and say we don't want it in our classrooms because we understand the dynamic of how controversial it's been on both sides and i just don't want that for any of our kids so that's my first point um second point in the process of just reviewing some of the old tapes um, i did come across a meeting from last january of january of 2021 and um, i wanted to make mention that in that our director of diversity he stated that his three principles um, number one being curriculum and number two being staffing so i think that's an important conversation to readdress as we go through the audit and make decisions and policies on what impact the lodi department will have in our curriculum and staffing so any follow-up to that would be great appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Earl. This is Red King. My name is my name is Lee Red Key and Mr. Miller, I really appreciated your last meeting that you said the pri schools would be closed at primary because the last primary the schools were open and I'll tell you being an observer inside I was a little fearful because that <clears throat> door was open students were right in front of them in a big room and i just felt very uncomfortable i kept my eye on that door all day long and i was an observer i was not a poll worker i was merely there observing so i really think uh, i thank you and i think the safety committee uh that made that decision to make sure that schools will be closed during primary it's a prime place for an event with the doors unlocked and a lot of people walking around and a lot of outside people mm. coming in. Second of all, uh, just to recap with uh, what Christy Ertel said, uh, the CRT, yes, I agree. And I want to quote one of your board members saying, if you see it, if you hear it, if you recognize it, if you're a parent, speak up, report it because I think there's been a lot of complaining and back talking and talking behind doors and so forth. If Matt or any of you on the board do not know it, how can you address it? It's hearsay. So I, I think moving forward, I agree with what Christy said, but I think 
we need to make sure that the right people that can make the decisions, do the investigation, and make the resolutions happen if they, they get to the right person. We talk a lot about curriculum, and I've been watching every Zoom meeting, whether I'm here or um, elsewhere, and or, or come to the meetings. But the curriculum, I know that it's going on the audit, but how much is it costing? Who is doing it? What do we expect from this outcome? How often will we be doing it in the future? Because it seems like a lot of meetings this year, or at least the last 12 months, have been focused on the curriculum. Talking about the curriculum. Well, you know, talk should be ending pretty soon. Shouldn't we have a result? Shouldn't we have an end to the curriculum audit and be able to move forward with that? Thank you for all the hard work. Enjoy the rest of your summer because you got 40 days to start it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I said that. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Mr. Miller's favorite topic, how many days till school? Thank you, Mrs. Redke. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Diane Wyatter. I have just a few comments. So just to comment first, uh, 40 days. I mean, you know, that seems like a, a biblical number. Are we watching out for something <laughs> here? So, um, all right. So a couple of comments here. First of all, always, always thank you to the board. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your work. Um, what you do, it's, it's, you know, I'm learning more and more. It's amazing. I think you are putting in tremendous effort on behalf of our, our community and our students. And thank you very much. So um, a few things here. Safety was brought up a couple meetings ago. I believe there was an announcement that there was $100 million from the state for safety equipment in the schools. And uh, just wanted to see, maybe ask the board, I know you can't respond to me here, but you know where we might be with um, applying for those monies and the encouragement and the consideration for perhaps um, something like metal detectors in the schools, if that's what that equipment means um, for us and for the systems. I'd also like to just uh, publicly congratulate and say um, just an acknowledgement to, to uh, Mrs. O'Connor as the president. I know I'm not supposed to use names, but because I'm referring to your um, selection for the public leadership conference and just commend you for that. And really, again, a note to, to the service levels that we have here in Lakota. Thank you. Um, Staffing, I appreciated that report um, as well. It will be helpful too with so much of the